A former Democratic congressional candidate went viral when she posted a false claim about the morning after pill. Pam Keith tweeted, quote, Tennessee just banned Plan B and made it a crime punishable by a $50,000 fine to order it. The problem with it, it's not accurate. Joining us now to explain, CNN reporter Daniel Dale with a fact check. Daniel. John, you're right. Tennessee has not banned Plan B. Plan B continues to be available to Tennessee residents. There is no fine for ordering Plan B. So the viral tweet is just plain inaccurate. Here are the facts. Last week, Governor Bill Lee of Tennessee signed a new law that increases the penalty for sending people in Tennessee abortion medication by mail or courier, makes that a felony with a fine of up to $50,000. Under both previous Tennessee law and this new law, doctors have to distribute abortion medication to patients in person only. But here's the thing, John. Plan B is not abortion medication. It is called the morning after pill for a reason. Its purpose is preventing pregnancy, not terminating pregnancy. Now, the language of the new Tennessee law makes clear that this mail restriction and the fine just don't cover Plan B and other emergency contraception at all. Second, the fine of up to 50000 is for people who provide abortion pills by mail, courier, or delivery. Again, we're talking abortion pills, not Plan B. And critically, John, the law explicitly says that patients are exempt from penalties. The penalties are for the providers who break the law, not for the people who order the medication. Now, Ms. Key's tweet was up for a few days. It got more than 26,000 retweets. She deleted it after I reached her by phone yesterday afternoon and explain the law. She eventually acknowledged she had misinterpreted it. She also said she never claimed to be a doctor, to be in Tennessee, or to be an expert in new Tennessee law. But I don't know, the tweet was pretty definitive sounding. And this subject is so personal that inaccurate claims, I think, can really affect both people's emotions and possibly even the life decisions they make. Uh, one abortion rights group in Tennessee told me they decided to put out an Instagram statement clarifying that the new law doesn't actually change much for people because people they're in touch with were taking in misinformation and getting confused about what the law actually does. You know, not just getting the truth, but getting results, Daniel Dale. Uh, so, look, if Roe is struck down by the Supreme Court, abortion law would be set by each state. What do we know about Tennessee's possible post-Roe future? If Roe is invalidated, Tennessee is planning to ban almost all abortions. It is one of more than a dozen states that has a so-called trigger law in place, a law that snaps into effect if Roe is overturned. And this trigger law says that 30 days after Roe goes down, abortion is banned. There is an exception for the life of the mother, but no exception for rape or for incest. And that happens 30 days after Roe is struck down. Daniel Dale, as I said, not just the truth, but results. Thanks so much for that. Thanks, John. All right, let's bring in CNN chief political correspondent Dana Bash and CNN chief White House correspondent Caitlin Collins. First, I want to ask you about something that Senator Ted Cruz said, which is that there are some in the Republican Party who are nervous about the possibility of overturning Roe v. Wade. I can tell you Democrats in Washington are holding on to that as their Hail Mary chance to save the midterms. They believe that people will be horrified and that'll help them win. And I got to tell you, more than a few Republican senators are nervous that's the case. We knew this, but it's so interesting to hear him say it. It is. And, you know, he also said in that same podcast, I think you're going to have a positive effect uh, of people in the pro-life community who have been fighting for this for 50 years. He might be right about that, but if history is any guide for us here on the way politics and political movements and fervor works, it's not on the side of the victor. And in this case, politically speaking, it, the conservative movement has been working on this for 50 years since Roe first uh, was w happened in the, in the early 70s. Now, the question really is about how much of a galvanizer this is on the other side of the aisle for those who have taken for granted that this would just be the law of the land forever. Again, history tells us that that is where the energy is more likely to be, not on the side of those who whose energy for 50 years paid off. And this is certainly something that a lot of conservatives have wanted to see for so long. Mm -hmm. It's been like one of their defining principles. But maybe it animates the base, but not necessarily the swing voters who are hesitant about something like this, mm -hmm. going had this ruling happening, this coming down, what it means for the future of that. And so I think that's where the concern from some of these Republican senators comes yeah, from. Yeah, and one thing I, I think is important as because we are getting into the nitty gritty of the midterms, uh, there is such a difference between the House and the Senate and the dynamics that could play out with this and, and other issues. 
there's so few swing districts left in the House because of redistricting and, and lots of other reasons yeah. that the, the pool of politicians for whom this could make a make or break difference is pretty small. On the Senate side, though, you have large states where you have lots of suburban pockets. You have lots of pockets where people who are energized could make a difference. When we covered Congress together, there were so many Democrats who were, yeah. uh, you know, pro-life. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about today, because here in a couple of a few hours, we're going to see President Biden giving a speech addressing inflation. There are so many Americans who are sour on the economy. What do we expect he's going to say? The thing is, it's the fact that he's giving this speech, that he feels the need to come out to address this, to talk about what his game plan is. When you hear White House officials say, you know, there are limits to what he can do to try to blunt this, but they say that they know that he has to be out there talking about it because they believe they want to show he is addressing it. Because for all the talk about what's going to happen with this Supreme Court ruling, one thing that we do know is right now the number one concern that voters have is inflation and the economy, and they don't think it's going well. And so you'll see President Biden come out and talk about what he's done so far, what he plans to do. But look at the reports this morning about gas prices reaching a new high, going up 17 cents just in the last week alone, I believe, in the last several days. And that's a major concern for them because, yes, President Biden released oil from the strategic reserves last month. Prices dipped a little bit. But as we said at the time, and as what analysts were telling us, experts on this matter, it's only going to be temporary and they're going to go back up. And right now we're seeing that. And you're hearing concerns are going to go up even further this summer. And so it's not an issue that's going away for them. And they know that it is number one. They are for them. hearing, I'm sure, what we are both hearing, no question, from, again, those Democrats who are on the ballot in November begging the president to get more involved on the issue of the economy, begging him to get out more out front on it. You know, there are those who say, well, I can just run separately, triangulate or however you want to call it. But for the most part, those who are running campaigns say that the Democrats' fortunes are tied to the president and the president right now is tied to the economy. Do you think right now, if we can switch topics and talk about Vladimir Putin and how the White House, how the president seen Putin after that speech that he gave yesterday on, on a, a key day on Victory Day, uh, what are they thinking now after Bi Putin really didn't say what they thought he might? He didn't declare victory. He didn't, you know, do some sort of victory lap or anything. What are they thinking he he's going to do now? Yeah, and there was a bit of a divided view in the White House of what yesterday's speech went from him was going to look like. Some said maybe he will try to declare victory or announce he's mobilizing more forces. Others were a little skeptical, given he doesn't have a lot of progress to tout at this at this speech. And obviously, he did not make any new announcements there. They watched it very closely. Uh, the officials told me they found it subdued, pretty muted. He didn't say anything new. They didn't really feel the need to respond in any great way to talk about what he said, because what's the point of escalating it any further? One big question that I think was revealed by President Biden last night when he said at a closed-door fundraiser is, Putin is a very calculating person, but right now they are have, having trouble figuring out where he is going next. And what is, a, what is a possible exit for him here? What is an end game where he can say, I have this tangible achievement, this is where I'm going to hang my hat on and attempt to declare victory in Ukraine? Because of course, things have changed so much from he wants to take the capital, that didn't happen. Now he's moved to focus on Eastern and Southern Ukraine. The progress there for the Russians has been incremental at best when you talk to Pentagon officials. So now what the president is talking about, what he's saying is, I don't know how he gets out of this war, is they don't know what it is that Putin feels like he can touch on, that he can then exit this war and still feel that his reputation is intact. And you heard the CIA director over the weekend say this. He thinks that right now Putin's mindset is he cannot afford to lose this war. Which is what he didn't expect. And it seems as though the answer is that it's possible that despite the fact that people have been looking at Putin as this chess player, as somebody who's playing the long game, who has a plan out for the future, that because his strategy in Ukraine didn't go the way he intended, he might no, not know the answer. So everybody in the U.S. government trying to get uh, inside his head, his head might not have the answer of where he wants to go right now. No. And I think one concern, we've tried to talk about this in such a measured way, because it is important that you do when you talk about this threat of him using a tactical nuclear mm -hmm. weapon. The thing that I think stands out the most for me is when you listen to the CIA director and he talks about this, and he says the chance isn't zero. We're not saying it's going to happen. They don't have intelligence that he's moving or posturing himself to make any kind of strike like that. But the fact that they're saying it's, it's not a zero chance and that he is conducting this nuclear saber rattling, his aides are, 
it, it does raise a concern for people like the CIA director. And I think that is such mm -hmm. an interesting aspect of this, as I think their concern is he gets kind of to the end of his rope, and that's a last resort measure that he Yeah, it may be a sign of his desperation, but it doesn't mean that he's not necessarily going to do it, or that there isn't a small chance. Yeah. Dana and Caitlin, thank you so much to both of you. I thank appreciate you. it. Watch Dana and Caitlin tonight for their awesome primary coverage. I'll be tuning in, probably in my pajamas. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>